From Cardinal Television Studio, I'm Kelsey Braun with your Fisher News Brief. COVID cases are on the decline or at least holding steady in many parts of the world, but the situation is not so rosy in Europe. The World Health Organization released new figures showing that European deaths were up 10% the first week of the month, and during that time, Europe saw more than half of the 48,000 COVID deaths reported worldwide. CNN's Scott McLean has more. It's been almost a year since the first vaccines were given in Europe, but you wouldn't know it from following the headlines lately on this continent, where it seems that one country after the next is introducing new restrictions or tightening old ones. Germany is in that category, having just recorded its highest number of new infections in a single day since the pandemic began. As a result, some German states are tightening restrictions. In Berlin, proof of vaccination, natural immunity, or a negative test will get you into restaurants or theaters today, but on Monday, a negative test will no longer cut it. And more and more states either have already or are considering whether to follow suit. Now, this is significant because Germany has always insisted on not discriminating against the unvaccinated. But things are changing so quickly that politicians, it seems, are pulling at whatever levers they can to try to right the ship. As bad as things may seem in Germany, the situation pales in comparison to many Eastern European countries like Bulgaria, Ukraine and Romania, which are still struggling to get their populations vaccinated with the first dose, just as many Western European nations are already focusing squarely on the third booster shot of the vaccine. Scott McLean, CNN, London. The world's largest pharmaceutical company is breaking up. Johnson & Johnson is spinning off its over-the-counter consumer health products unit into a separate company. It makes products like Benadryl, Band-Aids, Tylenol, and Motrin. No word yet on its name. Johnson & Johnson's pharmaceutical unit will keep the name that dates from 1886. It will now focus only on prescription drugs and medical devices, including cancer treatments and vaccines, including its COVID-19 shot. Both companies will be publicly traded. Johnson & Johnson's CEO told the Wall Street Journal the split isn't related to billions of dollars in lawsuits surrounding its talc-based baby powder and links to ovarian cancer in women. During the pandemic, the U.S. had a record number of reported drug overdose deaths in a 12-month period. The CDC says opioids accounted for most of those deaths, but some are now choosing opioid alternatives after surgery. Mandy Gaither has the latest in today's Health Minute. It's a crisis. More drug overdose deaths than ever. That may be causing many to rethink using opioids for pain control. It's incumbent upon us as patients to say, you know what? Not me. Andrea Herr witnessed firsthand the toll opioid addiction can take. That's why she chose other painkillers after gallbladder surgery in March. I've witnessed people lose their jobs, lose their marriages, um, and their life. Her procedure was done at Orlando Health. The Florida hospital has been giving patients over-the-counter pain medicine after surgery. Their combined effect many times is just as good or even stronger than uh, opioids alone. Surgeon Luke Elm says a combination of acetaminophen, ibuprofen, and muscle relaxers after surgery provides pain relief without the risk of addiction or side effects. If we give them an adequate alternative, properly educate them on the risks of opioids, and, and really make a concerted effort, we can really start to hopefully turn off the spigot that is um, the opioid crisis. Her says she didn't even end up using a muscle relaxer. I managed my pain with Tylenol and ibuprofen. I knew I had surgery, but I was not suffering. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. Right up to the filing deadline, voters in the Philippines were kept guessing about who would be running in next year's election. Among the prominent political names is a much-loved sporting icon who could be their biggest challenger. Ivan Watson has details. A professional boxer, the son of a notorious dictator, and a city mayor who once starred in steamy movies. Just three of the many candidates currently running for president in upcoming elections in the Philippines. So, 97 uh, aspirants for the position of president. This looks like a circus, but in fact even worse than a circus, this looks like a chaotic race. Perhaps the most famous in this crowded field, Manny Pacquiao a senator and recently retired world boxing champion. Which politician presents the most competition? 
for you? It's like boxing, uh, Ivan. I have a lot of uh, competitors. Um, you know, we fight inside the ring, but outside the ring, uh, we're friends. Kindly sit down. The unpredictable political landscape in the Philippines, shaken by last-minute announcements from the family of outgoing President Rodrigo Duterte. He's constitutionally barred from running for a second presidential term. His daughter, Sarah, filed for candidacy for vice president. Briefly, the elder Duterte threatened to also run for the same job, until he backtracked from competing against his daughter, instead announcing a last-minute bid to become senator. The election doesn't take place until May of 2022, but in this political system, the stakes couldn't be higher. Let's not forget in the Philippines, we have no run of elections. All you have to do to become the president is to win more votes than everyone else. A front runner in the current polls, Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr. His father declared martial law, ruling the Philippines with a terrible human rights record until a popular uprising ousted him in 1986. His mother, Imelda, still famous for her shoes. The Philippine political landscape has been dominated by two groups, right, since the fall of the Marcos dictatorship. Political dynasties, celebrities. And for a while, the celebrities presented themselves as kind of a self-made alternative to political dynasties. One critic of political dynasties, boxer turned politician Manny Pacquiao. That's my promise to the people, to the Filipino people, to end poverty, to end corruption. He calls corruption a cancer in society. Uh, all those corrupt officials uh, should be jailed. Pacquiao has been in a public brawl with Duterte, criticizing his administration's handling of the COVID pandemic, and he accuses the Marcos family of stealing money during their decades in power. If you were president, would you try to get some of that money back for the people of the Philippines from the Marcos family? That's definitely, I will. The veteran boxer preparing for the fight of his life in his country's political arena. Ivan Watson, CNN. Nike is postponing the release of its sneaker collaboration with rapper Travis Scott following the Astroworld concert tragedy. Nike made the announcement on its website Monday saying the move was a sign of respect for everyone impacted by the Astroworld tragedy. Ten people died when crowds started surging when Scott started performing. That includes a nine-year-old boy who died Sunday from his injuries after being trampled at the festival. The sneaker, officially known as the Nike X Travis Scott Air Max 270 Cactus Trails, was originally set to be released in December. A rescheduled release date has not been announced. People who have been using TikTok since before September could be entitled to money from a class action lawsuit against the company. TikTok has disclosed $92 million settlement proposal from its Chinese parent company, ByteDance. It comes from a federal lawsuit claiming TikTok illegally collected and used personal data from its users. The lawsuit cites both federal law and Illinois law that allows plaintiffs to seek money when their data is harvested without consent. You don't have to live in Illinois to claim your share of the settlement, but the state's residents could get up to six times more money. People who think they are impacted can file claims on TikTokDataPrivacySettlement.com. Just don't be surprised if your piece of the pie is tiny. A recent Pew Research study shows 48% of 18 to 29 year olds say they use the video sharing app. A terrifying study reveals that some honeybees react to the notorious Asian murder hornets the same way humans would, by letting out a scream. Jeremy Roth explains in today's Take a Look at This. A newly published study revealed a chilling survival strategy used by Asian honeybees to defend themselves from murder hornet invasions. The study showed the bees made frantic, high-pitched warning sounds similar to panicked screams when their nest was invaded by the giant hornets. Listen. <laughs> The signals, known as an anti-predator pipe, trigger a response by the bees to defend the colony using tactics like bee balling, where hundreds of bees swarm a predator and literally suffocate it. The study also noted that U.S. honeybees don't appear to have the same strategies as their wailing Western counterparts. From screaming bees to smashing pumpkins. Why? That's what a Missouri farm is inviting locals to come do to help usher out the festive fall season ahead of the winter holidays. It also gives the kiddos a chance to wave around hammers. Always good. 
But all joking aside, the event's primary purpose is to repurpose. The farm plans to reuse the jacked up jack-o'-lanterns as compost or food for livestock. And finally, to the moon, Snoopy! NASA announced a plush Peanuts pup will join their upcoming Artemis One moon mission to act as a custom zero-gravity indicator. It's a role he's played before. Here he is on the International Space Station. In fact, Snoop's been helping with NASA missions for more than 50 years. He's also been known to headline an anti-gravity gig or two back on Earth. For Take a Look at This, I'm Jeremy Roth. That's it for today's news. From Fisher News Brief, I'm Kelsey Braun.